Hey, yo, how goes it? Uh, well, I hope. Uh, so this is a clip of a recent chat I had with David Gunderson, a student who recently completed a thesis about, uh, well, about what's in the title of this clip. Diet choice as a predictor of personality. Now, I've made no secret about my increased interest in health, wellness, and nutrition. So when David reached out to me with the idea to riff on his thesis for a few minutes, I could not turn it down. The conversation was a bit more wide-ranging, however. We also got into the problems with scientific-slash-academic studies, touching on things like observer bias, the problem science has studying personality, and studies that, frankly, just don't go far enough, which I believe is part of what you're about to hear. If you like it and want to hear more, these raw episodes typically run for at least an hour or so, unedited, unscripted, unprepared, and are available for patrons who donate $5 or more a month. And you can sign up for that tier or any other tier at patreon.com slash occulture. But anyway, here is David Gunderson and myself making a bit of chit-chat about diet choice as a predictor of personality. Enjoy. Another... Um person who I'd like to talk about is who I got the um, the big five aspect scale from uh, specifically that this that scale that I used in my study was it was authored and created by uh, these two men Hirsch and Peterson uh, the specifically the the Peterson fellow is is uh, that's Jordan Peterson who you might have heard on YouTube or different things like that he's a, a phenomenal figure right now and uh, he he proclaims that he has an all meat diet. He just eats like chicken, and he, he does this for his own health reasons and and for his familial health reasons as well. And uh, I thought that is an interesting way that people people really picked up on that. Uh, a lot of people will will you know, talk about the carnivore diet. It's it's not quite the keto diet. I, <laughs> funny funny thing was um when I first started this study. What I, what I wanted it what I wanted to do was to look at people who are practicing keto diets because uh, I knew that they would be eating a diet of mostly meat and then looking at how carnivorians or carnivorans um, how they uh, react to personality measures that are differently than non carnivorians or omnivorians or vegetarians. Not that keto is a purely carnivorian diet, but it's the closest thing on a mass scale that has been promoted as an idea. And I thought that it's a fairly interesting thing. It is. Um, and I also don't think it's quite that simple though, which is why I wanted to talk to you about this because, you know, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, I've been cycling in and out of the ketogenic diet for a few years now. And along that same timeline, I have just developed this tremendous interest in health and wellness and holistic health and alternative ways of healing and, nutrition, and these sorts of subjects. And so when you consider what we've been talking about in terms of, you know, I guess the placebo effect and the power of the mind and how much influence uh, we have over our, our own experience here, and then you bring in something like dietary choices, if I believe that, that the ketogenic diet is going to heal me from whatever I may have, a certain condition perhaps, like Jordan Peterson had, or his daughter had, or maybe just I want to lose some weight, you know, and that, you know, going low carb and high fat and protein will allow me to do that. If I've convinced myself that that's going to happen when I'm on keto or carnivore or any other sort of low carb diet, that's probably going to happen, right? Just based on what we're talking about. So that's what is so fascinating to me about this study is that I don't know if it goes far enough. And that's not a slight to you. I love what you've done here. I just think like there's, there's probably more to it than just vegetarians versus non-vegetarians because we should probably pull out exactly uh, who you surveyed too and who you tested for this because it wasn't just vegetarians versus non-vegetarians. There was a cross-section of people who were vegans as well, right? And who were some other... Hold on a second. I actually have the... You had a graph in that presentation you sent me, right? I think. Yeah. Yeah. So I found it. And this this was... Yeah, this was who you tested. So a little over 80% of people in your test were what you call omnivorian, which is what you personally identify as. And it's probably what the average American... It's their diet as well. So this is, um, you know, where you eat meat and vegetables and you really don't... You, I guess you don't really have any specific dietary restriction that you place upon yourself. But you also have... 
some pescatarians in there. You have some vegans. And then you have some vegetarian subsects, I guess is the best way to describe it. You have uh, ovo-vegetarians, lacto-vegetarians, and then lacto-ovo-vegetarians. I don't know, actually, what those three terms mean and what the differences between those types of vegetarians are. So I may have taken us away from my original point of... Maybe there's another way to go about this test in terms of personality type, but tell us a little bit about what I was just talking about, though. With How do these three types of vegetarians differ from each other? Before I get into that, I, I just wanted to address one point that you made uh, about the in, infancy of uh, personality changes or or, mm-hmm. or did whatever uh, due to uh, the dietary changes, like uh, th- there are a lot of things that happen because people uh, correct their diets for themselves. And, and if they eat a healthy, balanced diet, like that can uh, cause a big change in a person's life. It's um, at a certain point, it's it's, diff- it's difficult to define how much of that is just because of nutrition and how much of that is because psychological profiles. But um, uh, addressing the, 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 the subtypes of vegetarians I included. So, well, wait, 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 uh, wait, 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 wait. Veg- David, wait, wait, wait. Sorry, sorry. You just sparked a good thought. Let's keep on that topic for just a moment. So, Yeah, I think what I was getting at with that commentary was physiologically the role that the gut and gut health plays in your mental health, you know, which is there are tons of, I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure you know of this. There are tons of studies out there and this is becoming more of a mainstream topic in health circles and also just in, it's, it's become this, this really sort of popular thing to discuss and I, I hear it more and more often not just not just in circles of people who are into health and wellness and nutrition and so on but also people who really aren't that they're having more of these conversations with their doctors and their friends and their family one that's exciting to me that people are are starting to understand their own bodies and their own health in a different way in a better way How that relates to our conversation here, though, is that, I mean, physiologically, like I was saying, there is something to be said about the types of food you're eating, the quality of the ingredients, and how that does play into your physical health and then also your mental health, which could also have uh, subtle or maybe even not so subtle personality and psychological changes that they could influence your personality to change or your psychological persona to change. And you can talk more about that if you'd like, because I'm not really sure if, you know, like a deep rooted psychological change is possible just based on diet. But when I look at the physiological evidence for how the gut and the brain work together, I think that there's something too. you know, like, well, okay, so being a vegetarian is great if you are doing it for compassion. But if you're doing it for nutrition, I mean, you might not be any healthier physiologically speaking, depending on the types of ingredients you are choosing to eat. Right. If you're eating boxed pastas all the time, for example, you're really messing with your gut health. You know, you're not really nourishing it in any way. So I would just I would love to see a long term study about this is what I'm talking about, because I would like to see how somebody's personality shifts over years of time and how their psychological persona shifts over years of time based on not only what types of foods they're choosing or sorry, what types of diets they're choosing, whether it's vegan, vegetarian, keto, carnivore or so on. But also the quality of the ingredients, you know, like, are they eating organic non-GMO foods? Are they eating processed foods? Because I know a lot of vegetarians and vegans who still eat processed foods. And, you know, it's great that you're trying to avoid animal products for compassion and because you think that they may be a food contaminant. But it's, you know, maybe not the best choice for yourself if you're not eating the highest quality ingredients in the vegan or vegetarian space, if that makes any sense. Well, I, yeah, I... I, th- I think you covered a lot of bases there. Um, I think it's important. Uh, I, I, I should, I should probably say that, you know, I'm not a nutritionist. I, I'm, uh, but yeah, given that I, 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 I think I eat a healthy diet. Um, the link between the gut and the brain is something that, like you said, is, is being studied at a much faster rate nowadays than we, we, we think of. I, I remember in my uh, freshman biology class, the, I had a teacher who, who talked at length about how she sent her, her own uh, feces into a, a, a testing facility. And they tested for the gut microbiome. Mm-hmm. And I still remember that to that day. It, to this day, <laughs> um, it, it, uh, it, it shows uh, how, how different, there's different um, genetic components to this and there's, there's different microbiology components to this. So uh, the, 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 microbes in our, in our intestines and things like that, they, 
do have profound changes on our psychological state. And that, that I think has been studied. I can't cite anything right now, but I know that um, poor gut health has been linked to nutrition. Um, if you, if you look at different uh, developmental disorders and neurological disorders, you'll find that uh, gut diseases of the, of the intestines and, and, and um, stomach are fairly common within that population as well. Uh, it's a very interesting thing that the one very important uh, part of this I, I would like to highlight is there's a, a theory called the vagal nerve theory. Um, this is that we have uh, these nerves that come out of our skull and that innervate our, our mouth and face and body. And, and this is how our how, uh, we get information from the brain to the body that's not via the brain stem immediately. Um, the one that uh, one of these nerves is called the, the vagus nerve. The, it's spelled V-A-G-U-S. Um, this, this nerve innervates our entire digestive system. It also innervates the heart and the liver as well. And this is the only nerve that innervates those specific areas. And it, it innervates, it's a fairly large nerve as well. And, and a part of this is that this, this uh, vagus nerve, it, uh, it deals with our parasympathetic nervous system in terms of how it affects our, our, ourselves. So it, like when we eat food, we may feel calm as compared to the sympathetic nervous system where we, it's like we don't eat food and then we feel like fight or flight. The, this vagus nerve innervates our liver and our heart as well as our intestines. And uh, it's, it's very interesting that we are finding more and more nowadays that the microbiology of our gut uh, does affect neurological changes as well. Like you'll find that in, in the intestines alone, that is the largest, has the largest concentration of serotonin in, in the body, I believe, it's like other than the brain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, no, it actually has, I think, more than the brain. I, I think the last I saw was like 80% of your serotonin was actually made in the gut, not in the brain. I don't know the exact number of uh, serotonin molecules in, in my gut versus my brain, but I, I would totally believe that. It, that sounds very realistic. So the idea that we have microbes in our gut, part of that is that these microbes, they help digest uh, the food that we eat. Like they help produce vitamins also as well. So like some foods uh, maybe don't sit too well for some people, but to sit well for other people. Um, that, that may be due to uh, changes or differences in the gut microbiome. I think the, the study of that and its correlates and personality, I think, what you're talking about, the expansion of my thesis and, and how it could be, how it could be done better. I, I would wholeheartedly agree with you uh, that a, a longitudinal study over a, of a larger group of people looking at how different changes in personality affect or <laughs> changes in diet affect personality. I think that that would be an extremely valuable study. I, I don't have the resources or time for that. Part of uh, the issue with uh, psychological research is that funding is, is difficult to find and, and recruitment. Like I said, I, I used emails and stuff, so that was uh, free to me. But sampling is a is a is a big problem with that. But uh, if someone were to complete a study like that, that would um, I think would have intense um, sociological, psychological, ethnological uh, effects within our society. Or people may understand a little bit more how different. Uh, traditions that they have regarding food affect like their familial behaviors or or how they interact with other people and if we could look at that at a societal level that would be valuable i think so too and i'm half tempted to just throw up a gofundme right now for that study that we can just do on our own so we may have to talk offline about that 